Welcome to the Answer uh, Podcast, the platform where the valor and vision of our military servicemen and women across all branches are brought to light. I'm your host, Captain Manuel Calo, and it's my honor to introduce today's team guest, Captain Javier Javi Medina. A beacon of leadership of, and wisdom, Captain Medina has made significant strides in the Navy and represents the epitome of dedication in military service. As we delve into, into today's discussion, it is important to note that the opinions and views shared in this podcast are those to, of the individuals and do not reflect the official stance or policies of the Department of Defense or the, or the United States government. Captain Javier Javi Medina is a dis distinguished figure whose military career is, has, is an inspired as is in exemplary. Born in Guayanilla, Puerto Rico, Captain Medina began his journey in the U.S. Navy in 1988, initially serving on board uh, the USS Iwo Jima and the USS Enterprise. His dedication and leadership led him from the enlisted, enlisted ranks to earn a commission through, throughout the enlisted commissioning program, a testament to his commitment and resilience. Over the years, Captain Medina has held various crucial roles, including division officer, combat system officers, deputy of operation officer, and executive officer. His leadership extended across the seas and ashore, contributing significantly to the Navy's mission and the broader defense community. Notably, his service had as the commanding officer of the Soul Craft Unit 4 and his selection for major command afloat highlight his exceptional capa capa capabilities and the trust placed in, in him by the Navy. Captain Medina's academic achievements are equally impressive. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science and Master's degrees in Public Administration with an emphasis on information, information systems and a PhD in Business Technology with a concentration in Applied con Computer Science. His role as the Norfolk Chapter President of the Association of Naval Services Officers underscore his commitment to service, leadership, and community. As we engage in today's discussion, Captain Medina, vast experiences from the deck plate to the command suit, his academic pursuits, and his leadership, both in and out of the uniform, will certainly provide us with invaluable insights and inspiration. So, without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Captain Javier Medina. Sir, Buenos welcome. Dia. Buenos dias. How, how's everything? So far, so good. I'm, uh, this is a fine Navy and Marine Corps day, and I will have to interject and say the Army as well. Yep. So my, it's uh, my distinct pleasure to be uh, here today with you. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Um, now, let's, let's begin with this. Uh, first of all, again, welcome to the Answer Podcast. Appreciate it for your time. I know you're in, in a vacation right now, right? So you're taking your time to talk to us and the leaders that are seeking for more and more in the in, in the community so let's let's begin with phase one we i know we talk about we're going to conduct this in phases so talk who, who, on whom is captain javier javi medina and where he born and where he grew up and how he joined the army all right so i come from the enchanted island of puerto rico i was born in ponce and grew up in a small town called guayanilla which i'm very proud of my hometown i'm very proud of the people that i grew up with and I feel like I represent that town and the island at, at large. So born and raised in Puerto Rico, uh, and my story takes me to serve into the Navy at the early age of 17 when I signed my contract. Came on active duty when I was 18. And um, it's been a journey. It's been a, quite a journey. I, I really have enjoyed it. It's been 36 years uh, coming up this September. And um, it, it's been... Uh, I would say one of the things that drew me to the Navy was mm -hmm. bumper sticker says, uh, sailors have more fun. And, and it's been quite a journey, like so, I said. So back in 1998, so how, back in the island, because uh, you and I from Puerto Rico, I'm from Puerto Rico as well. And when, when I was growing up, there was no, a little to none information about the military. How was that back in 1988? So do you, do you know about the Navy and the career system or went to your school on how, you actually engage to to get into the actual navy. So good, good question. So uh, it all started probably in 1976. Uh, my father took me to La Bahia de Ponce in Ponce, Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, the USS Ponce, named after La, la Ciudad Señorial de Ponce, uh -huh. uh, it was the second 
time that the USS Ponce has actually, has actually pour, pulled into the port of Ponce. My father took me uh, to see the ship and I actually have a picture of my dad and I with the USS Ponce on the background. And um, that was my first introduction. Later on, I learned that I have, a, at the time, I had a, a, a half-brother in the Navy. Okay. And um, dad and my brother exchanged letters. And one of those letters that my brother sent back to my father had pictures of my brother crossing the line. And the Navy has this tradition, what is called crossing the line ceremony. Okay. And we're sailors at the time just dressed like pirates and different customs and whatnot. And that captivated my attention. And I told my dad, Papi, I want to be like Greg. Oh. And, brother. and since then, it has become, it became a reality in 1988 when I finally signed my contract and joined the Navy. So, so that's how the story comes to your Navy. So how was the process like going through the recruiting process into the Navy? So once you decide, hey, I want to become, a, I wanted to be serving in the Navy. So do you, went to the, do you go to the actual recruiting station back in your hometown and do you take the ASVAB? Like, can you talk to us about that process back then? So incidentally, uh, the Navy recruiting, his name is uh, Angel Bellido from Ponce. Mm-hmm. Uh, Angel Bellido is actually a neighbor of mine now. He lives about eight minutes from me. Angel Bellido came to my high school in his uh, summer whites. Okay. When I saw him walking into my <laughs> cap, uh, the grounds of the school, to me it was like an epiphany. I'm like, SOA. I'm okay. definitely doing this. Uh, it was like a confirmation that I was going to join the Navy. So I, 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 I sought him. I went and talked to him very briefly. Uh, I got interested in taking the, the ASVAB. So I took the exam shortly after. Uh, but unfortunately, my score is very low. My no. English, my el domino del inglés, I've been full home. My, my, my that, that, happens, that happens to a lot of us in, in the happens island. Happens to the best of us, right? <laughs> okay. So yeah. incidentally, I, I took the test. I scored 22. I'm not ashamed to say it. I scored 22. And the only one that showed me an interest was the Puerto Rican National Guard. Sergeant uh, Lopez uh, was a female. She called my house and said, hey, this is Sergeant Lopez. You would like to join the uh, – I saw that you took the ASVAT, and would you like to join the Puerto Rican National Guard? And I said, I'm not interested. I really want to join the Navy. So I'm going to try again. And subsequently, I, I study. Mm-hmm. I bought the book. I study and I study and I study. And I recall saving a prayer. I said, God, if it's your will for me to join the United States Navy, I, I need to score something above 31. Okay. The minimum score at the time was 31. Okay, back then, 31. Yeah, and by the grace of God, I scored a whooping 37. Okay, they, like, it's, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. That, that's, that's, that's all you needed, right? <laughs> That's right. And the rest is history. You know, that, that's how I end up um, signing the contract with my parents. So in, interesting point is mom and dad insisted. And that's, I think that's part of our culture where our parents want the parents want their children to do better. Mm-hmm. So my mom and dad said, we will sign the contract if and only if you sign uh, your promise to go to college. Oh, uh, okay. Gotcha. And I will tell you, Carlo, I had no intentions whatsoever mm-hmm. at all to go to college. I did not consider myself college material. I, I have visited La Universidad Sagrado Corazón, La UP, La Universidad de Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. I visited uh, um a couple other universities. I just did not see myself as a college student. However, that was my one-way ticket out of the island. So uh-huh. I said, sure. Exactly. I do. Um, and then incidentally, uh, end up going to college later on. And that's part of the Yeah, so that's part, part of the conversation. So you decided, the pattern said, like, hey, you're going to promise me that you, could, you will go to college, although you didn't, you, you didn't know that you were going to achieve a PhD, right? Because in my actual introduction, you have a PhD, right? So clearly, like, you continued your, your path through the, the college, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, so then, so what happened then? So they released you go off the island of Puerto Rico. So what's next? Like you went to the Navy basic, um, oh, how that works with the Navy? And then what was the first duty station back then? So I joined the Navy September. I shipped out of, Ponce, uh, out of San Juan, mm-hmm. uh, landed in San Diego, California. Okay. I remember having acid blue uh, jeans and, and, a, and a thin sweater. 
And then September 12th of 1988 it was quite cold for Puerto Rican. Mm, okay. I landed in San Diego, went to basic training. Uh, I had no promises whatsoever in my contract. I had the bare minimum. Mm, and the Army would call it un soldado raso. I was a seaman recruit. Okay, which is uh, for us, it's going to be a private. A private, right? A private. And mm -hmm. um, I had no promises, no school, nothing. The only thing I had guaranteed was you're going to basic training. No specialty skill, no choice of orders, nothing. Uh, two weeks into basic training, they reclassify me. Uh, they checked my English. They, they took me through a crash course. Uh, it probably lasted two or three days. Uh, and I was able to reclassify, and I became, I was selected to become an aviation ordersman. Mm -hmm. Aviation ordersman works with weapon systems. Okay. On, on, mm -hmm. uh, as a result of that, I completed basic training in San Diego. They shipped me to Millington, Tennessee, where the aviation ordnance school was established at the time. And um, I did really well in school there. I was a number two student in the class mm -hmm. because you don't have to fun. I study a lot. Yeah. Uh, the language was a barrier, but the academics were not. And, and I put 100% effort into it. It surprised me because I had a classroom full of 36 students and I was a number two, yet I couldn't barely speak the language. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result of that, the Navy offer me an opportunity to meritoriously advance once I report to my first ship and I make uh, submit an application. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, right before I reported to my ship, I went to Puerto Rico on um, Christmas vacation, mm -hmm. came, uh, got to, a chance to visit my friends and family, return, and I reported to the USS Iwo Jima LPH2 out of Norfolk, Virginia, one cold March 17 morning in 1989. Wow. Wow. And uh, my brother was waiting at the pier. My brother was in the Navy. He met me there because uh, my brother was able to manipulate uh, the detailing system and say, hey, we want to put my brother in brother duty. Mm. And what that meant was that the two brothers could be stationed, oh, okay. not on the same base, but certainly Close. in the same geographical location. And that's how I ended up in Norfolk. Okay. So that's something um, curious about to me. Like, okay, so the Army does that, like, still to this day, they do the brothers... Uh, that that program still doing it yeah that's awesome like uh because i never i don't think i have i ever heard in the army we do that maybe i mean i know for the couples but i didn't know like actual brothers and and, and family but it's cool to know that, that that would happen and you ended up in in norfolk so can you tell any experiences on the uss iwo jima that once you start working that like can you share your experiences and how you face any challenges you 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 faced in in that position? Well, Manuel, I will tell you that my tour on board USS Iwo Jima shaped who I am today. Okay. Uh, you have to understand, I I went through a cultural background. Mm -hmm. I mean, a cultural shock, rather. Shock. Yeah. Um, coming straight from the island to the United States, the everything is different. Mm -hmm. Granted, we are U.S. citizens and all, but when I came to the states and I was actually settled. It was a culture shock, even coming into the division that I worked on. Mm -hmm. I worked in G Division, which stands for Guns and, and Weapons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was the second Hispanic in the division. So my immediate supervisor, his name is uh, Tim Timothy Jake Zamora. Zamora's from New Mexico. Okay. New Mexico. And um, he was my supervisor, and you would think that he will take care of me. Well, he did, mm -hmm. but not the way I expected. He was mm -hmm. my supervisor. He took me under the wing. He was rough, tough. Hmm. Okay. Because this guy was smart. He, over over the following two years, he trained himself out of the job and made me the work center supervisor. And he taught me the ropes. Um, he will never allow me to speak Spanish at all. Wouldn't return any comments in Spanish. He would not answer me in Spanish. Later on, I learned why. He barely spoke any. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, okay. Okay, you yeah. thought you thought he was speaking. Uh, he can speak Spanish, but he can't. Yeah, I thought he was just holding back on me. But in reality, <laughs> was he couldn't speak Spanish, so I'm like, oh, okay, I will give you a pass. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, so Jake's that's what we, we call him Jake Samara. Today he's a retired Master Chief E9 in the Navy. He retired for 25 years of service, and to this day, I'm still connected with him. He's back in uh, New Mexico. So my experience on board the Iwo Jima, besides being shaped, uh, taught leadership by Jake Samara, uh, Petty, uh, Petty Officer Bush. Uh, and, and a few other people in my division. Well, I had an experience. We went to Desert Shield and Desert Storm, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so that would have been my second deployment in the United States Navy mm -hmm. to the Eastern Mediterranean, Mediterranean, 
Mediterranean Sea and subsequently to the Persian Gulf. So during the Persian Gulf War, during Desert Shield prior to the war, we were, my ship was in uh, Manama, Bahrain, conducting some significant repairs to our boiler system. It was a steam sheet, ship. Make a long story short, I had a really traumatic uh, experience where we had a steam leak upon departing from the pier. We were going outbound. I would have, I would have to say 10, 15 minutes into our journey, mm -hmm. still in the channel, we had a steam leak that killed 10 of my sh shipmates. Wow. To this day, that still haunts me. Mm -hmm. uh, 10 sailors of my ship die uh, on that ship. Uh, by the time I completed my tour on board USS Iwo Jima, which was almost, almost four and a half years, I had lost 24 shipmates. Wow and a couple of Marines here and there. So uh, there was a lot of tragic mm -hmm. going on on that ship. Uh, LPH2 stands for uh, helicopter, he helicopter Landing Platform, but uh, they used to call it Death, death Star 2 mm -hmm. because so many deaths we had. But um, suffice to say, when you put the negative experiences aside, the successes that I, I achieved there, I was able to qualify it rather quickly was meritoriously advanced uh, as an, in the enlisted rank twice. Mm -hmm. Meritoriously. Uh, uh, in the Navy, you have to take an, an exam, pass it, and subsequently hope that you pass it with a high enough score to get advanced. And in my case, I would pass but not advance. And my division, my leadership, saw to me the potential and after they really taught me and, and, and led me where it, it resulted in meritorious advancements. And so... That's very telling. Well, so despite the cultural differences that I experienced on my first tour, one thing I'm very proud of the United States Navy, in particular the, the people that I work in my division, was that they saw me for the potential that I had in, in my leadership skills and my work ethic. And as a subsequent to that, I was advanced twice mm -hmm. in, uh, in, through the enlisted ranks. And I was awarded Navy Achievement Medal. And it was all, uh, to me, it was very rewarding, very fulfilling uh, because the, I wasn't being judged for my accent, uh, okay. where I grew up and whatnot. So that was that was good. And a after that, it was time to transfer to the USS Enterprise. Enterprise. So okay. can you talk to us about, uh, and I appreciate it, sir, for sharing that, those experiences in the USS Iwo Jima. I know uh, there's some sadness to the story, but I think... It made you stronger, and I made you the person you are right now. And, and you set the tone saying that USS Iwo Jima made you who you are right now based on those experiences. Um, yes. Can you talk to us in the experiences now with the USS Enterprise? So the Enterprise was, uh, while well, it was a challenging tour as well, a different environment. The ship was in the yards going through its uh, mid-life cycle. So at mm -hmm. this point, Enterprise was about 25 years old. It was a nuclear carrier. And my job was to do some, my, my, my uh, workspaces needed to be overhauled. So I worked there, I did that, but because at this point I realized that there's an opportunity to fulfill the promise that I made to mom and dad, okay. I decided it's time to go to school. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity presented itself, well, I was still assigned to the ship, the ship was in the yards, out of the water, mm -hmm. and I started going to college uh, at night and on the weekends. I mm -hmm. went to St. Leo College, and it's funny because you're in the army, and the very first place I went to school was at a Fort Eustis, had a uh, Fort Eustis, yeah, a, a learning center mm -hmm. in uh, Saint Louis College. I, I took classes there for about 13 months. I, I was bouncing against different uh, bases around the Hampton Roads area uh, to fulfill the minimum, and I mean the minimum requirements to uh, be accepted into the enlisted commissioning program. Mm -hmm. And what brought me to that point was I had seen the officers on the board of USS Iwo Jima, and I realized that I could do just as good, if not better, uh, than this young uh, young man. I just don't have a degree. So mm -hmm. I that kind of inspired me to pursue not only the college education, but also pursuing a commissioning path. And subsequently, I I had to start from scratch. Yeah. The only thing that I met as far as every criteria to be a commission officer was two things. Mm -hmm. One, I was a US citizen, and two, I had a high school diploma. Nothing so, else. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine. So very tumultuous uh, or pretty extensive checklist that I needed to complete. Uh, and then, you know, it's like, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So that's <laughs> what I did. I, I decided, let, yeah. me, let me go a little bit at a time. So when I was on the Enterprise, that's what I did. I, I went to school at night. 
made some sacrifices while well, my friends were all partying mm -hmm. and having a good time. This guy here was burning yeah. the midnight oil, working, standing duty, and going to school and doing homework. And I had a pretty regimental uh, pace of work school balance, and, and it worked out. You yes. Know? It it's all it's all about the, your sacrifices and, and and put in your mind what do you want so for the enlisted commission and program what was the requirements at the point so what, how many college degree uh credits do you need it etc in order for you to apply because you know you said you have two requirements only but what else like it is super difficult or is something that is achievable or for for those that are listening right now for that program they would like to apply so I will tell you, it was challenging. So like I said, only, I only met, at the time I, as I opened mm -hmm. the, 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 the criteria, criteria, I only met two of them. Mm -hmm. there, there, there were multiple things mm -hmm. I needed to complete. And what, to answer your question, uh, you have two options. You could uh, go for a technical degree or a non-technical degree. If you were going for a technical degree, they would allow you to come in with 30 college hours. Okay. If you were going for a non-technical degree, you needed a minimum of 45 credit hours. And I thought, let me go for technical. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I like science and, and technology and math. So that's what I opted for. And um, I met the minimum criteria, criteria, but I had a very strong package, uh, very strong evalu enlisted evaluations. And uh, I had the support from my chain of command. I had a support from my previous CEO. So I had a letter of recommendation. And mm -hmm. I, put it, I put the package all together and submitted it. And uh, I did pray about that. I said, God, if it's your will for me to become a commission officer, I pray that I get selected on my first look. And that was pretty uh, demanding, right? I'm like, but you know, to God, nothing is impossible. But I felt so strongly that if it's meant to be, I must be selected on my first look. I did not, because I heard all the stories of people uh, supply, submitting yep. multiple mm -hmm, times. Mm -hmm. And I said, God, I don't want to go through that. I, I, I'd rather just, if, if it's your will for me to do it, then pick me on the first look. And that's how it was. So but, one, um, shot, one shot, one kill, it, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was very fortunate. Yeah, and, and that's good to hear because uh, we have similar programs in the Army as well. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged, and i give you an example. So... Uh, my wife, uh, cousin, he just enlisted. He's a private in the army and he wants to become an officer. So that's a way that we can say similar to the Navy. So we have the yeah. ROTC or ROTC and then we have uh, the OCS. In order to, to meet the criteria, you have to sacrifice yourself because now I, I have to guide him like, hey, you need to have X amount of minimum credits to actually order you for you to apply. But there's a point critical that you mentioned that your buddies, they were partying, they weren't going out, they were doing all this stuff right. while you actually were studying and trying to get all the requirements in you for you to become officer. Yes, sir. And then, okay, so how was the school? Like, uh, once you get admitted to the program, how was it? Like, uh, it was challenging? It, it was something that was, it was good? Like, it was challenging? It was, it was extremely challenging. I... I guess it was some masochista because uh, <laughs> I, I, I chose I chose computer science, not realizing that uh, about a little over a third of the degree plan requires heavy math, mm. and math was not my friend. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, <laughs> so what ended up happening? Um, I spent I kid you not, Manuel. I spent five days out of the week in the computer science mathematics um, tutoring lab. Mm. I lived there, mm -hmm. you know, okay. so I had, I was an ROTC, so I had to do my military requirements, my military science, then all my computer science classes, but I spent quite a bit of time in the math and computer science uh, laboratory, and it paid off, you know, uh, I would come home, do homework, I was single all the time, so that kind of helped, uh, minimal distractions, but I, I spent a significant time of my week, I would take off Friday nights, uh, I will take off most of Saturday off, but I'll be back on, on doing homework on Sundays through for, through Thursday, mm -hmm. right? And I gave myself a little break. And even sometimes I, I did bypass that and still went to school, uh, meaning studying and whatnot. So it was very quite challenging. Mm -hmm. but, and I remember having C's at mid, by midterms, and I would, by the grace of God, I kid you not, uh, I would bring it all the way to an A at the end of the semester. But it took a lot. Mm -hmm. A lot of effort. And twice I second-guessed myself. Twice I tried to get out of the program, mm -hmm. uh, out, of, out of the um, uh, computer science program. 
Uh, last time I came one signature away from relinquishing that program and switching to information technology. We since business information technology, which seems sounds similar, but it wasn't. And um, I said, you know what? I made it this far. I might as well just suck it up. And, <laughs> and it worked. You know, I, I did really well. I was pretty excited that I was able to graduate. It, feel, it, seemed, it felt like a lifetime. Three years of college, it felt like a lifetime because we have to do full summers too. Okay. And then, yeah. it's, uh, so once you finished the program, what was next for you? So there I, I went, I got my commission. Mm -hmm. It was pretty cool. We had a secretary of defense came to Norfolk State University, and uh, his name was Cohen, William Cohen. He was the secretary at the time, and he came and did our commission ceremony. That was pretty good. And he pulled three Hispanic uh, commission, newly commissioned officers. He pulled us to the side and handed us a coin. And now uh, he's Caucasian, mm -hmm. and his wife is African-American, but he... He spoke Spanish. His wife was full in Spanish. He had affinity for Spanish speakers. So that, we felt pretty privileged to, to experience that with SecDef at the time. And uh, went to my initial surface warfare officer training. That's my trade, mm -hmm. uh, ship driver, if you want to call it, to simplify things. Um, that was challenging as well. That course at the time was six months long. Today's like six weeks. So okay, imagine. so they short. And I need it. <laughs> and I tell you, Manuel, I needed all six months to make it through. Wow. Yeah, subsequent to that, I, I got assigned to uh, USS Carr. It was a ship out of Norfolk. And I was told that ship was out of South Carolina. And there's a reason why I'm saying this. Uh, before I even finish my story, I will tell you, on my 36 years of, na of my Navy career, 35 of them have been in Norfolk, Virginia. <laughs> That's like almost unheard of. Um, three <laughs> different occasions that had ship's assignments that the ships were assigned somewhere else. And those ships, by the time I reported to the ship, they have done, done what is called a home port shift to Norfolk. So uh -huh. I never had to leave. Okay. You know? Yep. But, uh, yeah, did my initial division also tour. That was challenging. Very challenging. Um, uh, towards the end of my first tour in the USS car, I had a distinct pleasure to meet then Lieutenant Dennis Velez. And if you don't, that name doesn't sound familiar to you. I will tell you who Dennis Velez is today. He's a mm -hmm. two-star Navy Admiral. Okay. Dennis Velez is from uh, Adjuntas, Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. and he was my department head as I was about to transition out of the ship. I had like, I spent about six months with him. Mm. And it was great to see a fellow Puerto Rican Naval officer, a lieutenant, uh, who I was working for. Wow. And uh, so I, I felt pretty good about that. And just like my first supervisor from Hispanic descent, <laughs> they don't cut you any breaks. They don't treat you any better yeah. or, or any, any easier. Mm -hmm. They really hold you accountable because at the end of the day, that's what we want. We want to be able to represent and we want to do yeah, the very best. Course. And I appreciate that they didn't cut me any slacks. They held me to the same level, if not even higher. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like I was held to a higher standard, to be honest with you. <laughs> that always, it happens. Yeah, so but that, Lieutenant Villas is now a two-star admiral. He's wow. a phenomenal guy. He's a, he's a lifetime member of ANSO, and, and I'm very proud to call him shipmate. Yeah, so that, that's awesome. See if we can have him on the podcast. Uh, oh, soon. you definitely so, want him. That's for sure. So, so we can uh, talk to him. That, that will be amazing. Um, that's great. So, so, sir, so you actually had or have had various, various leadership roles in the Navy, so including commanding officer and executive officer positions. Can you discuss a particularly challenging mission or operation and how you led through your team through it? Well, I will tell you, just to get selected to be a, an executive mm -hmm. officer and commanding officer Hard. was challenging enough. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a surface warfare officer. I did uh, the vast majority, not all, of my tours on board Navy ships or Navy staffs. Uh, but the Navy is very selective, very competitive to select their officers, particularly in the surface warfare community, for command. And I knew what I wanted to do. I knew the milestones that needed to be met. And... Um, I knew it was going to be challenging, and uh, so I fully committed to it. I eventually be became a married man and had the fortune that my wife have always supported me and encouraged me, and I think the reason why I'm a full Navy captain today and I hold a doctorate degree is because mm -hmm. my wife empowered me to do that. Definitely. But the challenges that I experienced in my career up to the point of being selected for command, uh, there were quite a bit of challenges, having a lot of naysayers. I had people say, no, you'll never make it. Mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. been told you'll never make it beyond Lieutenant mm -hmm. 03, Army Captain for you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, I was told I'll never make it beyond that. And praise God, I did not believe the lie. 
In fact, you know what I did, uh, Manuel? Mm. I took that negativity, that that really poor leadership that was presented before me, because yeah. there, there were senior people and some peers that s- said that to me, and I kind of bowl, made it a bowl and put it fi- like fire in my belly, if mm-hmm. you will. And I, I used that and, and said, you know what? I am going to prove not only myself, but I'm going to prove them as well yeah. that I will succeed some one way or another, but I will definitely do that. So I challenged myself with the support of my family to get to the point where I was able to select for command. And, and I didn't select my first look or my second mm-hmm. look. I selected my third look. Okay. Uh, some people wouldn't brag about that, but I think it's important because, yeah, it wasn't an easy pass. Okay. I have to really strive for it. Yeah. And I don't believe it has anything to do with my ethnic background. Mm-hmm. I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I have very strong fitness report, which is uh, officer evaluation is just part of the timing and perhaps a choice of orders that I had. I, I, I can't tell you. I will tell you one thing. It was a lack of a strong, sound mentor. Hence why I'm a member of ANSO. Uh, okay. Having a yep. mentor in your career early in your yep. career makes a significant difference. Definitely. So Definitely. as a lieutenant commander, uh, I wisen up and decided, you know what? Let me take advantage of this new program that the Navy had. The Navy had what is called, at the time, e Mentor. Uh, electro- um, I think it was like Electronic Surface Warfare Officer Mentorship Program. And it was a, a pilot program, and I jumped right on it. And um, it was like a match program. Like, like if you think about a, a match app where they match you with somebody based on okay. likes and dislikes. Yeah, yeah. And I chose someone that looked like me who achieved the rank that I wanted to achieve, or at least close enough. And I picked uh, Rear Admiral Samuel Perez from uh, Texas. I picked him because I'll be fr- straight up with you. He was, he was a Hispanic successful naval officer who actually became a, a, a flag officer. Mm-hmm. And I thought if that guy made it with the background that he had, I looked at his bio, why not seek his advice and right. see if I could get some unadulterated feedback on my career as it stands and what are my chances to advance, promote, and select for command. And... If there's anything that I need to do to improve that. So I chose to select a mentor at that point in my career. And my advice to everybody else, don't wait so late to pick a mentor. Pick mm-hmm. a mentor earlier because that would have helped me shape and decide on better choice of orders. Mm-hmm. But suffice it to say, I selected for uh, executive officer and commanding officer. And I was assigned to Beachmaster Unit 2. Uh, and that's the pinnacle of one's career, having command. And uh, I went to Beachmaster Unit 2, which is exactly where I wanted to go to serve, a special mission unit. And that unit uh, was primarily comprised of mostly uh, young first tour enlisted personnel and a few uh, salty sailors, if you will. Uh, the majority of the, the command was comprised of junior sailors, inexperienced sailors. So that uh, in itself was challenging the tour and the, and the mission itself was challenging, working on, on the beach, uh, doing the ship-to-shore movement, bringing Marines and, and soldiers to shore and back to ships, and or doing non-combatant evacuation of uh, U.S. citizens and allies. So, and a number of other things that the beach masters do. And, and, and that was a challenging tour, but very rewarding. I, I worked for, a, at the time, Commander Jeffrey Grant from uh, Wyoming, mm-hmm. a Caucasian guy, phenomenal leader. I'm still in contact with him. He mentored me as his executive officer, and he thought I was fit to be recommended to fleet up and become the commanding officer in his relief. And, yeah. and that was a very rewarding tour. This, this. I completed that, completed that tour, and subsequently I went to a, a, a Phoebus uh, squadron staff after that. And uh, while I was at the – once I completed that tour, I went to my Phoebus uh, squadron staff as a chief staff officer. I was fortunate enough to work for a phenomenal leader named Captain Brian Finman. And Brian Finman was my commodore. I was his chief of staff. And, and he mentored me and um, trusted me as his second in command in that, in that uh, command. And an opportunity presented itself where there was an emergency need for an executive officer aboard, aboard a USS Wasp. And the Navy, in their infinite wisdom, decided that they were going to pick me. What's in- interesting about, a story, about that story is that by the time I reported, I accepted the challenge to become an executive officer in the USS was as an emergency uh, pitch hitter, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I consulted with my family. Hey, this is a challenging tour I'm going to do. Are, are we all on board? My wife said, yeah, I support you. My kids were all on board. I told my boss, yeah, I'll take the challenge. Uh, they have picked me out of a group of other people as qualified, if not even more qualified, to fulfill that role as executive also of the USS Wasp, which is a, a large mm-hmm. amphibious ship. Um, I didn't think I was ready for that job. Mm. I have not been trained. I have not been on the ship in about seven years since the last time I was on the ship. Um, I have been on ship, but not ship's company in a, in a period of about seven years because of the choice of orders that I had. But, uh, and I had no, not train, no training. And to fulfill that job, you have to be a major, uh, you have to be an 06 Navy captain already selected, mm. screened and selected for major command. That means that you selected for post ma- post command, which post is command. major command. Mm-hmm. And that's very, uh, very uh, uh, selective uh, process, Part, if you okay. will. I have not been selected for that, nor have been through the navigation and command at the major command level training. So I, I, that was missing in my record. Mm-hmm. The three-star Abra on the West Coast decided that I was his number one pick. Wow. It has to be by the grace of God. No, of course. I would not. I would. Let me put it to you this way. I would not have picked me. But, but God allowed that to happen. And it was a very successful tour. I spent eight months on board the ship as the executive officer. Mm-hmm. We brought the ship from San Diego, California. Actually, the ship was in Japan. I picked the ship out of San Diego. Brought the ship down uh, off the coast of Chile. And we went through the Strait of Magellan. Came back up and oh. made, brought it back to Norfolk. Norfolk. And... It took us about two months to do that, but overall, I spent about eight months on board a ship working for Captain, um, who was very good to me, uh, gave me recommendations for selection for major command, selection for captain, and his name was Greg Baker, uh, prior enlisted uh, naval officer who trusted me. He asked me one day, hey, how long, when's the last time you, you were on the ship? And I said, you asked me a straight question, I'm going to give you a straight answer. It's been seven years. You know what? I thought he was going to hold that against me, and he did not. Mm-hmm. He still empowered me to be his number two in command and allowed me to be successful on that tour. Mm-hmm. I had very senior officers working with me. Uh, the majority of the officers in the wardroom were, well, all the department heads, to be specific, heads of departments were O5s. Uh, so, and I was O5 myself at the time. And, uh, very successful, very competitive officers that were working. They they supported me on my role as executive officer, second in command. And uh, before I left that tour, the Navy uh, screened me and selected me for 06. And I was pretty excited because the chances for me to make 06 were like slim to none. Mm, okay. Mind you, uh, when it comes to qualification, I exceeded all the qualifications that I require. I have a total 24 additional qualification designations, which is in excess most people have uh a number in a neighborhood of 15 i had 24 uh but that that was no guarantee you know the only thing i could tell you is that because i knew my career was going to be challenging i sought out every opportunity that i could to acquire additional training acquire acquire additional destination in the hopes that you know i make my my record more competitive and show myself worthy of at least screening and I'm very grateful and humble for the fact that they did select me. Uh, again, I, I, I would attribute that to the grace of God. Gotcha. So, so it's great to hear this. This story is like main thing. Uh, mentorship is is crucial, right? and we hear how mentorship can change and, and and lead you through the path. Because like sometimes what we see is is even enlisted or junior uh, officers they don't seek for those advices and they. They just want to do their own thing. But if you seek for those advices, we'll lead you to the, to your next step. And, and we heard that on your career. Now, the other thing uh, I will ask you, sir. So, and this is, you mentioned that this is a very challenging process, for example, like to be hand selected to serve as a executive officer in the USS WASP, because you, you mentioned that. Uh, what, quali- what quality do you believe are essential for effective leadership in the Navy? Can you share? So I would attribute some of that to the fact that I I was taught early on in my career to be forthcoming, um, lead by example, and have a strong work ethic. And I will give credit to 
Perioso Samoro, Masaji Samoro now, who was my first line supervisor back on the USSC with GMI in 1989 through 1993. That individual taught me what I needed to know and instilled in me, pour into me leadership, training, accountability, work ethic. And because of that, I, I was taught what right looks like. And I think because I pursue higher education, additional qualifications, uh, sustained superior performance at sea, uh, sustained superior performance even on staff or shore duty, all combined and it was sustained throughout. It wasn't like a white, uh, white uh, sine wave, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I was always consistent on that. And I challenged myself and held myself accountable um, knowing that I'm in a fishbowl and everybody else from the outside looking in. I think that that helped. Um, the record spoke for itself and my leaders who have to answer questions and pick up the phone calls, hey, tell me about Commander Medina. Mm -hmm. You know, that it was unsolicited. Uh, wasn't shared with me until after the fact. It's uh, very rewarding to hear that, uh, humbling and makes you feel fulfilled you know that you don't write even in when no one is looking mm -hmm. and um not settling for less you know i i think accountability is important right being a good leader and sending examples and doing what is right even in spite of challenges being a, being able to say no when people expect you to say yes and try to comp uh convince you otherwise you you stand what is for what is right right if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that is something that I would attribute to my ability, my, my, my fortunate to being selected for uh, in screen for, for being that XO on that ship, yeah. you know, and, and being able to be receptive. So, you know, I'm about to be 54 years old, mm -hmm. highly educated, one not successful career. Got it. One thing I will tell you, Manuel, I don't know at all. Mm -hmm. Right. And I still feel like I'm a una esponja. I'm like a sponge. sponge. I'm still yeah. learning. I'm still trainable. I'm still willing to listen and change. And I think that is a soft skill that I have. You know, I am willing to listen and, and adapt and overcome rather than be stiff and, and unwavering. You know, there's it's a time and place for that. But when it comes to personal and professional development, mm -hmm. you have to be receptive. Right. And um, don't know if our culture empowers to be that, you know, because we have a sense of pride and that sometimes could affect our ego mm -hmm. and we have to be watchful of that. So I would always advise people, keep your ego in check and and be open to be receptive okay. and be open to be trainable, mm -hmm. right? And know that if you don't know this, you should know that you don't know it all. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, no lo sabemos todo, so keep and check your egos and be be willing to listen to others because sometimes like it's not my way or the highway. You have to be willing to actually listen and 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 be em, em, empathetic to to the situations that might Absolutely. arise. Uh, sir, so as the Norfolk chapter president of the ANSO or the Association Naval Services Officer. What initiative or project are you most proud of and how do they impact the naval community, if you want to speak about that, and the ANSO community? I tell you, ANSO, first of all, I heard of ANSO probably between 10, 13 years ago. I, I don't remember. I went to one meeting, never came back. But it wasn't until uh, Lieutenant Commander Machado, not Commander Machado, reached out to me a few years ago, I would say three, four years ago, uh, he inspired me to join ANSO again. And this young, tall Cuban guy from Miami inspired me to join ANSO again. And um, again, I was receptive. I had an experience with ANSO. Like, oh, that's just some meeting, whatnot. But this guy inspired me to rejoin ANSO. And a year later, I ended up relieving him as because he was a chapter president at the time and he had mm. orders elsewhere. So I relieved him as a chapter president. And my very first challenge there was to set up the Eastern Region Symposium. Mm, okay. And so we had the um, Eastern Region Symposium. Uh, it was very challenging, very small group of folks. 
Uh, we were working for Captain uh, Roy Love, now retired Captain Roy Love. He was our national board member uh, captain. I mean, uh, chapter, I'm, I'm sorry, national board president. Mm -hmm. And uh, he empowered us to put together this symposium. And with his support, uh, his heavy engagement into that process, we were able to successfully do that symposium. And subsequent to that, we have done three or four, uh, three more symposiums, two in the East Coast, one in uh, the West Coast, and we are about to have another one now, but this one will be a joint symposium with the NNOA or the National Naval Officers Association, mm -hmm. primarily focused on African American. And uh, we're going to join them uh, this summer. But the challenges that we had was working this nonprofit organization while in uniform with a mixed group of folks, uh, have warrant officers, LDLs, Navy, all the Navy captains, junior Navy personnel, E6s, E4s, E3s, in, in an organization that is all about volunteers, but mm -hmm. with one common uh, goal, which is, you know, to recruit, develop, and empower and retain the talent uh, in the United States Maritime Forces, right? Mm -hmm. So that is the United States Navy, United States Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard. And we even open up to NNOA, I mean, uh, NO, uh, NOAA. Uh, mm -hmm. So... We, we're very fortunate that we have a good, strong, persistent group of volunteers that help us through those uh, meeting, monthly chapter meetings, mm -hmm. and in particular the symposiums, which are very cha very challenging, mm -hmm. where we bring together flag and general officers from the Marine Corps, Army, and Coast I mean, uh, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and Navy. Mm -hmm. We haven't yet bring Army yet, but I know the <laughs> Army has quite a few boats, probably more than we do, from what I'm told. But uh, we may explore that as well. Yeah, because all it's all about the marathon forces. Yep, yep, yes, sir. Um, and then, okay, so let's talk about. I know we're about to come an end to this podcast. It's great to hear your experiences. I have a couple more questions to wrap her up, sir. So, we with a career that spans various roles and responsibilities that the the, the one we've seen so far. How do you manage the balance between professional development and personal life? Very good question. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a very uh, strong wife, mm -hmm. uh, very uh, secure woman that is independent and supportive. My goodness, she's very supportive. So I have a very supportive wife and children. My son is 19, my, my daughter is 17, and I have extended family live here that support me. I got my mother-in-law that helps us out a lot, quite a bit. And I have a strong, uh, not only family support group, but also my church group. Uh, the church that we where we congregate and worship, as well as a small group of friends that support myself and my family, that that have allowed and empowered me to be a success in my career. Let me tell you, the challenges along in uniform is one thing. When you compound your your personal challenges, you're you're trying to balance your co personal commitments and and whatnot. You need a strong support group, and you need to be fully grounded as a as a human being, as a man. In my case. Uh, I would attribute my faith in God and my reliance on the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to do my daily duties, be able to meet my requirements, my fulfillment as a husband, as a father, as a church member, as a leader in my community, as a leader in my service, um, and be able to set time aside and commit to making time where there's no time and hold on to those commitments helps you to do that having a supervisor or a media superior in charge above you that supports you when you say hey i'm going to take vacation i'm going to, I'm going to take leave i need some time off and they allow you to do that and empower you to do that it contributes to that balance that you need at work the command where i'm at now assault craft unit four is a shore and seaside command so we have two different unit identif identification codes shore and seaside And uh, it's an operational command with a very strong supported shore side, uh, primarily focused on maintenance. So our responsibilities are pretty pretty big. We got 144 acres of, uh, of space that we work on and a multi-million dollar craft. And to include the people that we work with, I have 600 and some sales and a number of civilian contractors and civil servants that support our mission. But I still have time to give people time off, like, Right now, we have a 96-hour special liberty. So my command is off today mm -hmm. and on Monday. 
Uh, and we do that because we get our work done. We fulfill our requirements and sometimes we even exceed them. So then we could cut time, cut back and allow people to have some time off to take care of their Defending. personal uh, issues. Mm -hmm. That was not the case when I first joined the Navy. Mm. You know, it was all work, all work, no time off. It was rough. Uh, I remember being in three section duty. You had duty every three days. And God forbid you have duty on, on, on a weekend because you have the weekend too. So you would be on the ship five days straight without going anywhere. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, so we know we all been there that, but it's yeah. great. It's great that the, the U S leader are taking care of the families because ultimately our, our, you know, like the people that work for us or for the Navy or like the soldiers in our case and the shipments and the, those, those the workforce and we need to take care of them as they take care of the mission. And, and that's great to hear that you you are giving family time back for the personal um, in your case and your job. Um, now, sir, as we wrap it up, uh, what aspirations for the future, both within the Army, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> within the Navy and in your personal life, uh, what are the aspirations for your future? And then last question, uh, second question, find, uh, for those aspiring to a career in the Navy or seeking leadership roles, what key le lessons or pieces of advice will you share based on your experience? Okay, so um, I will start with the, the second question first. I would advise folks that, um, recognize that you will be challenged and the military, the Navy, for, for instance, uh, doesn't discriminate. You know, you are given an opportunity to prove yourself, to take the challenge that I've set before you, but nothing's going to be handed to you. You have to earn it. And it's all going to be based on your performance, your willingness to work, to having yourself, hold yourself accountable and abide by the rules and regulations that are presented before you. You will be challenged with little things. And if you're able to accomplish those little things, then you'll be afforded to do higher response. And you will have higher responsibility, higher accountability as well that goes along with that. So it is imperative on you to challenge yourself and not settle. Don't become part of the group. You need to stand out. And you stand out by performing above and beyond the expectation. You, you've got to recognize that you work for somebody. And if you're in the military, you're fulfilling a command's mission. Ultimately, that's what it's about, fulfilling that command's mission. Whether it's, you know, we're all war fighters. Even if you work in the admin office or a supply office, being a, con uh, a, a quartermaster like, like, like you are in the Army, mm -hmm. you all have to contribute to the fight. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So your commitment and your fulfilling those duties and responsibilities is important. You volunteer to serve in, in, in this service, in this force. It is your requirement to fulfill those commitments that you set yourself forth for. So you don't, you need to strive for advance through your ranks, right? Fulfill their requirements so that when you require, when you request special, uh, for example, you apply for a special program, let's say you want to get commissioned, then it's not going to be handed to you. First of all, you got to be fully qualified. qualified. Mm -hmm. You have to be, well, when we select somebody, they are fully qualified, fully eligible. Not partially, not somewhat, not 99% is fully mm -hmm. compliance with the requirements. And that's just the starting basis. That is not the ultimate. That is the starting. So you have to understand what the requirements are for whatever it is that you're applying for. If you're just doing your daily job, you got to understand what your responsibilities are and meet those. And don't settle for less. Contribute to the equation. Don't take away. Be a plus, not a minus, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so y y understand the, the instructions that you have to follow in order to apply for the programs you want to apply. If you are going to make it all the way to E9, then understand what the milestones are. What are the requirements for you to advance to the next rank and not assume that they're going to advance you because you've been in long enough. Mm -hmm. Time in service is a factor, but it's not the factor. Mm -hmm. I will tell you what's the factor. The factor that matters is performance mm -hmm. and two, fulfilling milestones. If you are a quartermaster and you're doing something that's strictly administrative and only administrative and you continue to take duties as an administrator, you're not fulfilling your quartermaster job. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If you are a, an engineer in the, pl in a, in the plan in a, on a gas turbine ship 
and you're doing something that has to do with morale, welfare, rec. You're taking all these extracurricular activities and you're making them your priority and your primary duties are not being fulfilled. You can't expect to be recommended. Mm -hmm. Cannot expect to be advanced promoted. Same. So you got to understand that very clearly. So understand that. And with respect to what I, what I see in the future, well, by the grace of God, I, I'm, I'm already talking to the Department of the Navy to allow me to retire next year. Okay. My goal is to retire and uh, have a change of command and retirement ceremony on the 16th of, the, of May of next year. That's mm. what I'm hoping for. <laughs> Friday, 16 May 2025 is what my goal is. And subsequently leave the service, uh, be a civilian on 1 October of 2025. Okay. And so that time between May and October, my goal is to do some uh, skill bridge training, get some certifications under my belt and prepare myself for the transition. Mm. I'm already mentally preparing for the transition. And I'm told by multiple folks that have been going through it, they have gone through the transition process, how challenging it is. And the key and the common denominator that I hear every single one of them tell me is start early and make time for yourself. I have given and we have given our, our service the years that we have. It's mm -hmm. time to give a little bit to, back to yourself in that process while still fulfilling your duties and responsibility, while still yeah. be challenging yourself. So it's not time for you to kick back. It's you piling that on mm -hmm. to your daily duties, but you got to make time for that. Yeah. So I'm excited, looking forward to retirement uh, next year and hopefully become a consultant. Okay. I'm only wanna I only wanna work three days out of the week. <laughs> and I'm that's willing life. to travel twenty five percent of the time. That's three months out of the year. That's quite a bit. But okay. I'm allowed to travel, so that wouldn't matter. But that's what I wanna do. I'm 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 beyond blessed. Nice. I have met, if not well exceeded all of my earthly expectations, if you know what I mean. Yes, yes sir. Yeah. yeah, so that's that's awesome. Like, uh, that's uh, the a lot of us aspire to be in that you know the stretch in that stretch at the end. You know, trying to start prepping uh, your packets for retirement. You know, fulfill your role, and then get your DD two fourteen, and then become right. become whatever okay. you want to become. And then you're gonna grow your beard, and then like you're gonna do whatever you want to do. <laughs> uh, that that's amazing, sir. I do appreciate uh, your time. You know, like being here and share with us your experience. Experiences. I bet this is going to be um, a great leadership lesson for, for those that are listening to this podcast, whether they're ANSA, whether they're in the Navy, Marines, Army, it doesn't matter. This is a great because I, I can't, although you have so many years, 30 plus years in the, in the Navy, I can relate some of your experiences with my own experience because like the, the the beauty of this is we become from the same island, right? And then I can, hey. although you you know, commission or enlisted in 1988, I can hear some of your experience related to my experience between, because I, I started this career in 2012. So a lot of the same challenges there and there, but sir, thank you. I know you have uh, stuff to do now. Um, I want to appreciate on my behalf and on behalf of the answer podcast to be here. It was amazing and I'm grateful for being here t today. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. And then I'm going to be closing out, sir. Thank you. And then, and uh, that concludes another enriching episode of the Answer Podcast. A heartfelt thank you to Captain Javier Javi Medina for sharing his journey and insights with us today. His dedication to service and leadership in the Navy is a powerful reminder uh, of the commitment and courage that define our military across all branches. To our listeners, thank you for tuning in. If, if you found inspiration in today's conversation, please subscribe, share, and leave a comment on YouTube and our YouTube or Spotify. Your engagement helps us to bring more stories like Captain Medina's to the forefront. Follow us on social media channels for updates and more ins inspired stories from our military community. Until next time, keep striving, keep learning, and lead with integrity. This is Captain Manuel Calo signing off. Let's go.